Um, our goal today is to give you a picture of high school, um, how it was designed at St. Constantine, how it's implemented, why we do the things we do. There are several ways in which high school at St. Constantine is very different from really anywhere else that we know of, including other classical schools. Um, and so um, oftentimes that you know, needs explanation. Um, sometimes people can be like, I don't know, why haven't you guys thought of just doing things the way everyone else does? And I hope usually the answer to that is we actually have, I promise. Um, and there are very good reasons for most of what we do. Uh, when we find that there are not good reasons for what we do, we try to change it. So um, my goal today is to give you an overall picture of how the high school at St. Constantine was founded and why, um, and how that plays into several of our sort of biggest and most influential elements of the school and how they then point to our goals as to what we think a successful high school graduate looks like for us. Um, then we are going to hear from Chris a little bit more specifically about cultural formation in the high school and I'll talk about before that a little why that's so important to us. Um, and then after that we're going to talk about sports um, and how sports fit into this picture and then at the end John is going to close um, to talk to y'all a little bit about um, some recent, though unsurprising, research on especially young men and adolescents and what that is looking like in our modern culture and how to change it because it's not great. <laughs> um, and we'll close with that um, because it affects young women too, right? Like if you have young men who are suffering, young women are also suffering. Um, so I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about how how most of our um, faculty and administration, where we came from before we started this school. Um, my entire career before starting St. Constantine was in higher education. Um, I worked for a grad program in California um, in ap apologetics, where I was a recruiter and admissions officer. Um, we got to travel kind of all around the United States, um, bringing in grad students to a program. Um, and then Dr. Reynolds uh, became the provost of HBU and invited me to come to HBU to start a homeschool support program. Um, we launched it and it started as the academy at HBU. Um, it was a series of dual enrollment classes that happened for homeschoolers on the HBU campus, but then also took place throughout high schools around Houston. Um, homeschool support sites, um, large private schools, small private schools. Um, yeah, we even had some um, partnership with public school systems and um, John Muller and Chris Yee came out to be teachers in that program. Um, Megan came to start working for HBU in um, student success. Um, for those of you who remember um, Bob Stacy, who was our original provost, who's now moved on, um, he was the associate provost at HBU. So between us, we had this big sort of, um, we had a lot of years of experience in higher ed. And because I was working with dual enrollment students, um, the three of us were, and Tim Bartell as well, um, we were seeing a lot of what was happening in high schools. We were dealing with high school and junior high age students. Um, and then we were also teaching at the university level and seeing what made a great undergraduate. Um, and it was very apparent that those two systems were not talking well to one another at all. And that our high schools were not designed to produce the kind of students in undergraduate program who were most successful. So one of the things that we had at the very forefront of our mind when we started St. Constantine High School was what does that college student, what does that young adult who's moving on to college and career look like? What should they look like? What should they be able to do? What should they be able to think like? What should they be able to process through on their own? And how do we use high school to get them there? Um, my classes at our local Christian schools were um, for juniors and seniors only. They were great books courses that you could only get into if you had a 3.8 or above. Um, and even then it was application only. And we found that these very high achieving students, one, were willing to do much more work to read these great books than, and get worse grades, um, because they did tend to get worse grades from me than they would from their other English teacher. Um, because they felt it was meaningful um, than being in a class that would have been an easy A for them. Um, so we saw them very willing, very able 
to do very like challenging work if they found it to be meaningful. We also found that for the vast majority of their education, even in these very expensive, very elite Christian schools here in the city, that was not happening. Um, we went to a very large, very popular um, Christian school to introduce the Great Books program we were about to start the next year. We were meeting with their juniors honors English class. Um, and I asked the class, um, just as a way of introduction, like, what's a favorite book and, of yours? And one girl said, oh, I don't, I don't think I have a favorite book. And I was like, oh, that's fine. Uh, what's the best book you read in this class? We were at, it was May. Um, so they'd been in the class for the full school year. And her teacher wasn't in the room. Um, and she said, we, we didn't read a book in this class. This is honors English at a, at a school that cost their parents $30,000 a year. Um, <laughs> they, they read like, um, oh man, this happens to us all the time. We have students who come from other like Christian or classical schools and we'll be like, okay, we're going to read Plato's Republic. And they'll be like, yeah, I read that. And we're like, no, I promise you didn't. And they're like, yeah, I did. I was like, how long was it? Mm, 10 pages? Yeah, no, that's, that's not it. That, that's. That's an excerpt, um, and that, but that's what they're reading, right? They're getting these select passages um, that um, they are then taught. I, I was actually working with one of our St. Constantine college students who, again, went to a great, uh, you know, great school by many metrics in Katy, um, who her whole experience of English in high school was AP English, which sounds like a really, that should be really good, right? Um, but what that means is that books are just means to an end of getting a score on a test. So you were taught a particular way of reading, which means you take the passage and you outline it so that you know what the answer could be when you're asked the question. She actually doesn't know how to read a book because that's all she's been taught to do. She was the valedictorian of her high school. She's a really high achieving student and now as a freshman in college, she's having to learn to read again because if you have just a testing-oriented matrix, that's not happening. Um, so we were seeing this. We were seeing these really high-achieving students who wanted to learn. Like, these were the best students in their high school, and they just weren't being given the full, like, the, they, if you hand them the Iliad, they're going to read it, and they're going to be interested in it. Just no one was handing it to them. Um, on the other side, we were working with college undergraduates, Megan in particular, ran our Student Success Center at HBU, which meant she was seeing the students who got to college and realized, uh-oh, like, <laughs> I can't do this. I, they were failing tests. She worked with lots of student athletes um, who were struggling in their classes, but not just student athlete, athletes by any means. And so through that perspective, we were like, some of these kids had really good GPAs in high school. So why were they struggling so much at HBU, which is not the world's most challenging undergraduate education, right? Like this is very run of the mill. Um, and there was a couple of things that seemed dumb that were harming kids over and over again. Um, one of them was time management. Um, how often in high school were they being asked to be in charge of their calendar? And that includes that when they study and when they turn things in and um, what they deliver in class to the teacher. Almost never. Um, students are often, um, especially in private schools, being given daily assignment sheets that go to the student and the parent um, so that they just have to look at that one daily assignment sheet, produce what it says, turn it in the next day and be done. Um, then you get into a college class that meets two or three days a week you're given a whole semester syllabus and nobody's reminding you about anything. Um, this was tanking students over and over again because they thought, well, I don't know what to do. I'll just play Halo. <laughs> and um, suddenly they had really bad grades. Um, so that was, that was a big piece. Like we thought, okay, something's not transitioning right between the way we treat high schoolers as little kids and the way we treat suddenly freshmen in college as adults. Now, no, everybody knows they're not right, really adults, but we are starting to treat them that way. Um, so that was a big element. Um, being asked to do long-term projects of meaningful work where, again, you don't have a lot of teacher daily, like, keeping on you or parents daily keeping on you um, was often very, very challenging for undergraduates to do. Um, and then 
there was something that was a little harder to quantify, and it may be the most important. You get into a college humanities class, and for better or for worse, and a lot of this is, especially in secular schools, for worse, um, it's not going to be so much about the technicalities of learning to write and read. You're going to be talking about a lot of things that require a great deal of critical thinking and ability to think for yourself, to read the text well, to interpret it, and to defend what you think. And students were not being taught to do this. So it was personally devastating and painful to watch high school student after high school student come from really like good families and good schools and get their first atheist philosophy professor in a t-shirt who looked cool and knock them right off their pedestal. And it just doesn't need to be like that. <laughs> like that guy doesn't have what we have. He doesn't have the access to the truth that these students should know about and they just, they just didn't know. They just hadn't been given the tools through which to think through what some of these cool and powerful people were saying in their classes. So these were very much on our mind when we were starting St. Constantine, particularly as a high school. I had at that point been working with high schoolers for four years. Um, so we had a lot of really like strong ideas about what we wanted this to look like. And I think a good way of encapsulating that um, Aaliyah, this is low battery. I don't know if that matters or not, but just so you know. Um, a good way of encapsulating that is thinking of high school as a period of time when we're at least endeavoring <laughs> uh, to bring a child from childhood to the beginning of adulthood, whatever that looks like for them. Um, it may mean going to college. For most of our students, it does. <laughs> um, it may mean going into a career. It may mean taking a gap year. But at some point after high school graduation, they start taking on a lot more personal responsibility, or at least we expect them to. And they need to be ready to do that, whatever that looks like in their lives. And I could find no high school that was particularly oriented towards that, towards this idea that at 18, after May, for some reason, they're adults now, <laughs> have we prepared them to be that? Um, so Chris is gonna talk a lot about what we do culturally. It's one of the weird things we do at the school is we take a lot of time out of school. We go on retreats, we have field days. We, um, like the, the senior, if you're a senior this year, you have four retreats throughout the year. Um, and they are, they're kinda like, woo -hoo, we win. Um, but that's because we're like, there's a lot of preparation coming. Our junior senior retreat um, is coming up next month. I'm so excited about it. It's my favorite time of year because we take our juniors and seniors who by the time they're juniors and seniors are mostly just delightful to be around. Like they, we just enjoy them. And we go to a family's ranch that, see, that um, houses 40 people and we just enjoy our time together. Like they're starting to plan it. They're gonna do some sort of like a talent show and. Uh, but one of the things we do on that retreat is start to commission them, like commission the seniors toward, like, <laughs> getting, getting choked up thinking about it. <laughs> this year is really hard for us. Like our seniors have been with us since seventh grade. Our juniors have been with us since sixth grade. And Chris and I like weeped our way through high school retreat at the beginning of the year, like because we love them so much and they're about to leave us and we don't know what we're gonna do. So, um, but we commission these seniors as they're moving into their adult life, of like take the things that you love and that are good that you've learned here and take them out into the world wherever you're going. Um, and we commission our juniors of, all right guys, it's you. You're the leaders of this school now. You're the ones setting the examples for the four-year-olds, for my four-year-old who's watching you, um, for the seventh graders who are watching you. And, they're not perfect at this, but they do take it to heart that this is their responsibility. And we see a big shift between 10th and 11th grade as they start to take that on. Um, I think coming from this college background, thinking about high school as how do we launch kids into adulthood, um, both those things have made me I, I don't think any of you should care about getting your kids into college, and I only mean that in one way. Colleges need your kids. More so now than ever, they need you <laughs> more than you need them. 
you, and if you're looking at very competitive or specific colleges, if you want your kid to go to Harvard, yeah, that's still super, super hard. Um, we do have students at Rice. Um, we had a student admitted to Rice when they admitted 7% of their applicants. Um, we have a student at Georgetown who it's not quite that competitive of odds, but very competitive um, application process. If your child wants that, they can't, we can't get them there. But the mass, vast majority of colleges need your student. And college admission is not the hard part. Being prepared for college is the hard part. Being ready to go into adulthood, to take this very first step, and to be able to uphold your values and your faith, to do the work that is set out before you faithfully and well. That's what's hard when you're 18. <laughs> um, college is actually fun and exciting to get into. They're gonna make it seem like you won a giant scholarship and most of it will actually kind of be student loans. And like there's all sorts of wonderful, exciting things that come with getting into college. The doing of the hard work in college is where the rubber meets the road. And so we're much more focused on what does it look like to be successful once you're in college than just the race of getting in. We could do that and we could do that well, but it takes time and money and we would actually kind of rather than be like reading a really good book <laughs> instead of spending lots and lots of time applying to colleges. Um, so in high school, I'm gonna go over our curriculum a little bit and then I will talk about college um, admissions prep in particular. Um, all of our eighth graders, if they're on our, like if they've been here at St. Constantine, will get through Algebra 1, um, which admits them into geometry in the ninth grade, which will get them through calculus by the time they're in 12th grade. Um, part of the math track, um, pre-trig and, um, or pre-calc and trigonometry is a um, dual enrollment class. Um, so our students have the option of taking AP calculus if they want. Um, but they will also get four units of college credit in college algebra through the normal course of their studies. So if you're going into a BA degree, um, like in my BA degree, that was all the math that I needed for college, so I would have been done um, with math without taking an AP exam. Um, one of the reasons that we emphasize dual credit at this school over AP is for two reasons. <coughs> dual credit is much more widely accepted than AP exams, and even in places where AP exams are accepted, which is most universities, they don't fill up your credits, they just take the um, requirement away. So you don't have to take a math class, but you have to get four more credits to fill out your degree. So you end up taking knitting or something, I don't know. So as a parent, AP doesn't save you any money, and as a student, it doesn't save you any time, but it may save you requirements. Um, and so we also just don't like the um, orientation. Well, we don't like the college board generally, but that's a different lecture. Um, <laughs> We don't like the orientation of AP, which is like you study for a year, I hope you do well on that test or it's all for naught, right? Like we don't, we don't do that as a school. Whereas dual credit is you're earning the credit as you go, it's built into the grade, um, students can opt out of it if they're doing exceptionally poorly, um, but mostly our, like, I don't 100% of our juniors and seniors are just getting their dual credit right now. So um, that pressure for that one day, three hours is off. Um, the last two years with COVID has also just like shined a light on examination-based achievement. Um, the SAT and the ACT have not been able to be sat regularly in the last two years, which means the vast majority of colleges have gone to test optional in um, their admissions process, and my guess is most of them will stay that way um, because the ACT and the SAT are not good predictors of college success, and colleges sort of know that. Um, what is the best predictor is your essays and your interview. And guess what our students are really good at? <laughs> Writing and talking. Um, so in math, we have that. And then of course in the humanities, every single one of their humanities classes, whether that be great books or the supplement, which is logic, American history, economics and government, and the senior ethics seminar, all of those classes are dual enrollment classes, which means they are taught by a college professor, um, secretly, that's what we are. Um, and they apply to a college transcript from William Jessup University, which is a regionally accredited Calif California university. Regional accreditation is the gold standard of accreditation. So any university that accepts any other regionally accredited university has to accept those credits as well. Um, the student at Georgetown, um, Georgetown gets to do whatever it wants because it's Georgetown. So they have a rule that they'll only accept four classes. Um, that's their rule, that's fine, but that's universal. So he 
submitted four of his eight classes that he had, and that was that. If you want to go to some place like Harvard, they may not accept your transcript, um, but we have lots of students at Baylor and A&M, and they all do. Um, so by the time our students graduate high school, they have 28 college credits um, that are fully accredited. It cuts almost a year or about a year, depending on your major, um, off of their required college classes. Yeah? 28. 28. Yeah. Um, so typically you'd say, like, when I was in college, I took 15 units in the semester. Um, some people are overachievers. They do, like, the full 18. Um, I worked a lot, so I didn't. Um, so that, was, that would be 30 credits in a year. Um, so our students have 28. So if they decide to go to the college at St. Constantine, they are only at college for three years. Um, for most of them, if you get a BA, you'll be at three years. Um, if you like decide to go into chemical engineering, um, a lot of those will transfer. You may have specific requirements that mean less of them do. Um, so major and the university always gets to decide. Um, but the vast majority of our students have Everyone has been able to transfer in something, um, usually at least half, um, and the vast majority can, has been able to transfer in all. Um, so the nice thing about that is that us as parents get to think about that and think, great, that's a year of college tuition we're not paying for. Um, the students don't think about it much at all. Like if you talk to them about their dual credit classes, they'll talk to you about like the books they're reading and stuff, but the fact that they're earning college credit doesn't come up on a daily basis. So again, unlike AP, there's not this pressure of performance where you're aiming towards this test and you better get it done well. Um, my husband, he, he wouldn't mind me saying this because he tells the story to our high schoolers a lot. He took four AP exams by the time he was done in high school and he got a one on all of them, <laughs> which <laughs> doesn't get you anything at all. <laughs> so he was like, I took those classes and uh, that's that. Hey guys. <laughs> um, so that's a very David Gilbert thing to do, to like walk all happily into an AP test that you're going to bomb. Um, but that just, <laughs> that, that just doesn't happen for our high schools. Like they, when they're done with ninth grade, they already have um, six units of the credit they're going to apply towards their, uh, towards their high school um, or towards their college. Um, Let's see, our science program. This is something that a lot of people have wondered about. Um, Houston is a science city. Like, we're engineering and oil and medicine, and this is really, really important. High school science is really important. Um, but the funny thing about high school science is it's sort of like pretend. <laughs> because if you're an actual scientist, you know that you probably need to have finished calculus in order to do much when it comes to a lot of the math that you would need to be actually in engineering classes. Um, you need to know like a lot of biology in order to get into pre-med and med programs, but you're also going to learn most of that in college. So what's really important about science is being able to do the hard work of studying science and taking these things in and having those study skills. Um, we were so, so blessed a few years ago when Dr. Augustus walked into my office and said, hey, my kids go here. Do you ever need someone to teach science? And I was like, uh, yeah, we always need someone to teach science. And she was like, great, I have a PhD in biochemistry from Rice. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, she had been teaching at Purdue online. Her kids were all here. Um, and she has just been an incredible addition to our faculty um, ever since. So we know we have the people in place. Um, Mr. Harris is another one of these people who wandered in and was like, I think I'm interested in a job. And we we're like, OK, well, what's your background? He said, well, I was just finishing seminary, is thinking about being a Catholic priest. But my actual uh, master's degree is in aerospace engineering uh, from A&M. And then you know, I have my physics degree from Notre Dame. And I was like, <laughs> great. <laughs> And he was like, and I think I like teaching fifth grade math. I was like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> so we're still working on him. We're like, can you please teach physics? And he was like, oh. Um, so we have these wonderful people who know how to guide our students who are really interested in this way um, towards these higher levels of science. They also know how to give them the foundations that they need. One of the things that we have not had, um, 
facilities is always our <laughs> low point. I actually had to apologize. We had a lot of prospective families in the first session on the lower school. And I was like, this is not the room I should have brought you to. Um, <laughs> it's our biggest classroom, which is why we use it. But the eighth graders are in here all day. Look, all the ceiling tiles are falling down. Uh, <laughs> Um, we're working on that. I'm going to give you a tiny preview at the end of this that I'm not supposed to say till too much until the gala, but um, big changes are coming that we're very excited about. Um, but one of the facility um, inadequacies is we don't have lab space, right? Like we don't have the kind of things that lots of bigger and fancier high schools have. Um, I know lots of doctors who were homeschooled, so I figure that must be overcomable. <laughs> um, I dissected a pig. Well, I didn't because I thought that was gross, but people around me dissected a pig in our, my parents' front lawn because I was homeschooled too. Um, so we do bring in um, a lot of opportunities for scientific work, and one of the very first priorities of our growing facilities is to get the lab space that we need to do that even better. Um, but we have always, as a school, prioritized people over spaces. So if we can hire a Dr. Gustus, we know we're much better off than if we spent the money for her salary on a lab space, um, because teachers are the key to learning important things. Um, the other, um, of course, element of a high school education is foreign language. Um, all of us went to high school. Probably all of us took foreign language classes, and probably not a lot of us speak a foreign language. Um, this is sort of the... Uh, bane of American <laughs> education, we are just really, really bad at languages. Um, because we're an Orthodox school, a lot of our um, constituents come from like Lebanon. They're trilingual, all of them. And that's just part of their culture. And we just don't have that culture. So a major question for us throughout our time at St. Constantine has been, how do we better develop languages so that it's meaningful, like that you're actually learning a language? Um, this was especially important to Dr. Reynolds, who's been in higher ed. Um, college languages are even worse than <laughs> high school languages. I took three semesters of Spanish. I didn't even know Spanish by the time I aced the exam. Like, I, I don't even know what's happening there. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we've really invested in is training in our teachers in the natural method of language acquisition. This makes our language classes look a little different, but they're going to be very oriented towards the spoken language. Um, you may notice this if you have kids in Spanish in high school, um, but it's certainly happening in Latin and Greek, too, in junior high, where they're orienting themselves much more towards speaking things. Um, Megan uh, Muller, who was here earlier, said that she got tricked by a group of second graders, or no, it must not have been second, fourth graders, um, as she was subbing for a Latin class. Um, they said, give us this command um, so that we can practice. And she was like, okay. So she said it out loud. It turns out the command was stand on your desks. So they all... <laughs> stood on their desk and she was like okay and now I don't know how to tell you to get off so <laughs> that's fun um, <laughs> but those are the sort of things they're trying to practice and Mrs. Uh, Katrib does this with Spanish um, and Arabic in our high school um, we have teachers waiting in the wings to add French and Russian um, onto our languages as soon as our high school is big enough to divide students in that many directions so like French and um, Spanish and Arabic and, um, and then, or you can continue with your Latin studies in advanced Latin as well. So there's three options right now. We would love to grow those options. Um, we've taught French in the past too. Um, that's something that could easily be resurrected. But I know we have lots of Italian speakers. <laughs> so if you guys ever wanted to talk about that, we could. Um, and then of course, all of you are familiar because you're junior high parents with the great books. Um, this is an enormous hallmark of our school, not because we don't think science and math is important. Science and math are incredibly important. But because the great books accomplish a great deal of things towards this goal of orienting ourselves from childhood towards adulthood. Um, great books education is different from a typical English education in the way it is focused. Um, we are not going to spend lots of time talking about a novel foreshadowing whatever it wants to foreshadow. I don't care. I, <laughs> I was an English major. Um, this, like, this is my work. Uh, maybe Mr. Muller and Mr. Dalby care more, but I don't know. Uh, what I care a lot more about is um, what is this saying about the human experience? What does this mean in being a good man or a good woman? What is it saying about God or the world? Um, because these are the questions that teenagers are thinking about. Um, they're thinking about it if they're watching TikTok or a TV show, or they're thinking about it if you're putting the best books in the world in front of them. 
So I want to do it when they have the best books in the world in front of them. And not, I don't know how much you guys are on social media, but it's very luxury. Like recently, you have lots of people like pointing fingers at you and being like, don't buy a house in this market. And you're like, who are you? Why, like, why do I listen to you? You're a woman dancing on the internet. Um, <laughs> but this is like, our, our children are inundated with people telling them what to think constantly. And so one of the um, most important things about a St. Constantine education is that it is dialectical. And this often gets misunderstood because of uh, the University of Chicago and some great books programs there as meaning that we're seeking uh, um, an unknown truth that no one really knows the answer to and it's a free for all. This is not what we mean when we say dialectical. We are much more of a Platonic school, um, a Socratic school, which means we are seeking truth with everything we have. And we are doing it because we believe that truth is real and it is out there and it is knowable. So whenever we're asking a question, it's because we absolutely believe that question has an answer. And if you're teaching at St. Constantine, you believe the truth of that answer is held in God. Um, that God is goodness, truth, and beauty all within himself. So anytime we are talking about seeking those things out, we're seeking God. Um, it doesn't look like that all the time when your 13-year-old, when you have seven 13-year-olds in a room, 15 13-year-olds in a room, um, fighting over if a particular song is good or not, right? That can sound a little trivial. It's not trivial. What they're debating is the nature of beauty and whether or not it's objective. Um, we have seen huge cultural movements start by denying the objectivity of beauty. And you do that for a little while, it's very easy to deny the obje objectivity of any sort of truth, right? It always starts, Do Dr. Reynolds has an amazing lecture about this that I'm always trying to get him to give to the school community and he's always resisting me because he likes to say new things every time he talks. Um, but we, you can often trace cultural shifts by starting with the artists, starting with the people who define beauty for our culture and the uglier it gets, the sooner you know that truth won't be far <laughs> uh, behind it. And so we spend a lot of time discussing these big ideas and we do it through the great text because you need to have grounding. It's actually a little bit easy, um, like it, it wouldn't be hard for me to walk into a room of teenagers and ask them a really provocative question and for us to have a really exciting conversation about it. But giving them a text that they have to think critically and well about and they have to be justified in the way that they think about it sort of grounds that conversation. So I was subbing for Mr. Yee last week um, and the juniors were reading Frankenstein. It's one of my favorite novels to discuss with high schoolers um, because it asks questions of what does it mean to be a human being? What is the responsibility of a creator and a father? Um, what is, why is relationship like friendship and family? How, how is that important and how does it ground us? Um, and so these were the things we were talking about throughout the week, but what you don't get to do is be like, I think that um, people are like this, you know, and like um, that means that everyone is good. And we'll say, why do you think that? And what are you seeing in the text that informs that question? Because then they're not just like dealing in a vacuum of their own thoughts. Um, they are having to deal with Mary Shelley's thoughts. And Mary Shelley may be right or she might be wrong. But the reason we're reading her is because she has been powerful. Um, she has said something that has stuck with us for a long time. So we read Karl Marx in the senior year. It's not because we think he's right. It's because we think he's influential. We think his ideas have had power over cultures that have changed the world. And we need our students to read him for himself and think very, very hard about it. Um, our sophomores in college read Karl Marx this week and we're ready to seize the means of production. Um, they all work for the school. And it had been kind of a hard week, so I was like, please, seize the means you take over. That's fine. <laughs> See how you like it, instead of just you know, s observing the playground. Um, so uh, Great Books Education does a lot towards our goal of moving students from childhood to adulthood. Um, as Great Books Educators, all of us have done this now for many years. Um, there is distinct differences in the kinds of conversations that we will have and we can have with a ninth grade group, even a really exceptional ninth grade group, 
um, and the 18 year olds. And it's not like content based. It's not that like we're talking about really like sexy subjects when they're 18 and not when they're, it's just their minds are different. They're not quite developed in the same way and they haven't had four years of practice. Um, it is oftentimes sort of the like rest year when we get assigned to be the 12th grade great books teacher because it is like talking to peers. You get to bring a great book and have read it and have a great discussion with people that you're really interested in what they have to say. Now, I actually think all of our students are pretty interesting, so it's usually very fun to have these conversations with all of them, but by the time they're in 12th grade, it really is just a pleasure to help them think even more and more um, carefully and closely about the things that we're reading. Um, I, I get to do this with our undergraduates too, and a lot of them are um, new to this process. You know, they came from a variety of different schools, and our 11th and 12th graders have better discussions right now than our college students do because of the practice that they've had for the seven years that some of them have been with us. Um, I read an article a few years back that I, these are sort of ideas that I always knew. Um, I, I had the privilege of being great books classically educated myself in high school and college. It was so formative to me that I knew this stuff in my spirit, in my bones. Um, but I read an article a few years back and it was actually an article assessing a book called Norms and Nobility. Um, the article itself though talked about what it means to be a democratic nation and the qualities of a citizen needed to um, promote and maintain a healthy democracy. And the article asserted, and I think this is directly from the book, that um, you cannot be a successful democracy without having a few things. You have to have access to uh, information, to good information. So you have to have free access to information and then you have to be able to assess it and think about it well and critically and then make a value judgment about it. If you're not able to do those things, you are not able to maintain democracy because you're not able to vote well. You're not able to participate in the formation of your own free government. Um, I found this both exciting and terrifying <laughs> because I don't think that that is the orientation of the majority of education, even religious education. We tend towards a belief that if we give them all the right information, we just put it on top of their heads, we give them the right liturgy, the right lectures, the right ideas, that, that will, they'll take it on and that'll be it. If that worked, I would do it. It would be easier than what we do. You guys have teenagers. <laughs> you know that's not how teenagers work. They have to ask questions. They have to challenge. They have to wonder why. And so I think that rather than thinking that of that as a bad thing, I think we have to think of that as the qualities of a free people. And we have to give them the ability to do that well. Or else we are not just betraying them, we're, we're betraying our republic. We're, we're betraying our very community's ability to be free. Um, I think this happens at the individual level as well. If you cannot take in information, think about it well, and think about how it applies to your life and your values, you yourself cannot be free. Um, so if we seem to emphasize the humanities too much, it's not because of a lack of love for math and science, it's because we think this is the formation of childhood into adulthood. Um, this is the character building and the virtue um, development that is so important to being an adult. Um, I can't promise, I wish I could promise that our high school graduates walk into the world and they stay faithful to their faith and to their family and to their community. I can tell you that the vast majority of them do. Um, and I can tell you that when they are walking forward they're not going to be convinced that the Christian faith is stupid. That won't happen. They know better than that. Um, they may be convinced for a while or for a long while that it's false. Um, we have an a, a alumni from our previous program from the academy who identifies himself as an Aristotelian atheist who's really into Aquinas. And we were like, okay, we'll see you back in church soon, right? Like, you, you do that for a while, but as long as you're pursuing the, the truth and you're pursuing great minds who are thinking well about these things, 
I will be praying that that is a rapid progress back to the faith because I believe it is. Um, and that's what we see in a lot of our students. We see um, students who at least wrestle with hard things very well. I will say that the um, ecumenical nature of our school also contributes to this in a way that I personally really, really value. Um, I grew up in the evangelical world. Um, all of my friends went to churches that were exactly like mine. And there's a niceness to that. Like, we all spoke the same language. We all lived the same culture. Um, I went to a university that was just a part of that world. Um, I went to grad school that was a part of that world, and that's very comfortable for me. Um, but when those church services started to seem hollow, or when I was betrayed by a particular pastor and felt like this might not be the place for me, I didn't know where to go, right? I identified it so closely with God himself that it felt like something I had to reject. I don't think there is a chance that our students growing up in the school could think that. Um, my own children go to an evangelical church on Sundays and then love a bunch of Orthodox priests that they see almost every day. Um, I think for them that means if they decide that their dad and I are like super dumb and that evangelicalism is super dumb, they know what they can look at the alternatives. And I, I want them to go father, father, follow Father Joseph rather than the atheist down the street. Um, and I see this every day in high school. We see our high schoolers debating um, their, particular, um, their particular traditions, um, especially when we get into sophomore and junior year. In freshman year, um, they're reading mostly Greek and Romans and just thinking about how terrible those guys are. Um, in sophomore year, the first half of it is the early church fathers, which are part of the, the um, councils of the church that all Trinitarian Christians really ascribe to. So whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox, these are foundational issues about God becoming man and being fully God and fully man and um, these things that we have to be able to work through as Christians, but we actually pretty much agree on. And then we get into the second half and we read Luther and Calvin and things get really spicy. Um, so <laughs> what's really wonderful about that is oftentimes I find that the students don't actually know their own traditions very well at all. Um, we had a debate with a group of students I absolutely adore. Like they're good students. They're 15, um, we're sophomore year and we were reading Ignatius um, from the second century who was writing about the importance of bishops in the life of the church. And he argues really persuasively for the role of the bishop and he says really strong things. Like the bishop stands in the place of God and he is the voice of God on earth to you and you must follow the edicts of your bishops. And the class was like on board. They were like, yes, bishops, so important. We are into bishops, that is, so, that is really good. And so I asked, how many of you go to a church with a bishop? And nobody knew, not a student knew. Half the class was Roman Catholic. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have bishops! <laughs> you Methodists, you don't! Like, I know what bunch of ones you have in your church leadership. Like, let's think about this, right? Like, um, and so it was like really like, because you don't talk about that in your church youth group, right? You don't spend a lot of time thinking about the differences between churches. You may assume them, but it, it's amazing what 14 and 15 year olds can have assumed their whole life without ever thinking about, right? So I knew that some of them knew bishops. They had just like never thought about it. There's an Orthodox kid in our class. I was like, your bishop was here last week. <laughs> you had lunch with him. You remember the guy with the hat? <laughs> like, you know, and it's just they just hadn't really processed through it. And so that that like, so, like over the years, we now have a senior class that comes from very different Christian faith traditions, and they fight about it vehemently, but they fight about it really well. And I think um, like our Catholic students know more about Orthodoxy and love Catholicism more than they would if they were somewhere else. Um, at least that's been my experience. Um, I'm very excited for my kids to grow up in that environment, um, knowing that their classmates are from many different traditions. And of course, we don't require you to be a Christian to come to this school. So there are students, um, not, a lot, not a lot of high school, but there are some. There's, in the sophomore year, um, there's, there's some kids that don't, like their families don't ascribe to any particular faith. And um, we have absolutely had students who come from families who don't have a particular faith who become Christians because they're a part of this dialogue. Um, we had some students who were um, adopted from China and their mom actually was a Christian, um, but they were adopted in high school. And so that was not their background or experience at all. And by the time one of the brothers graduated, he, he was a believing Christian. And not because anyone had like proselytized with him, um, but because 
he had found it through argumentation with his classmates. Um, he was at least a theist. You know? Oh, okay. yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I think more. I think more has happened. Um, oh. But so those are maybe those are weird goals. Those are probably not things that you hear in a lot of pitches for high schools. Um, but there are goals, and um, they're why. Uh, in some ways, our sports teams are a little lame. Our facilities are a little lame. Um, it's why we go on retreats so much. We'll get better at that stuff. We'll get bigger and we'll get better. But we're not going to, like, that's not what we're going to invest in first. We have to get the right teachers here. Um, one of the hallmarks of our school is we prioritize full-time employment for all of our teachers that we can um, or that it's right for them. Uh, so we have lots of part-timers here who, like, are moms and, you know, have kids at home and that's what they want. Um, or have other careers and they're doing this on the side. But we prioritize full-time employment and a living wage for a teacher. <laughs> Nobody's getting rich, but it is a living wage for a teacher so that we have very high, very high faculty retention. Um, I can count on one hand the amount of people who have left um, once they've been a full-time employee here. Um, and that's hard. 80% of our budget goes towards salaries. Um, which means it does not go towards building a gym. <laughs> we want to build a gym, and we will. Um, one of the last things I get to tell you a tiny bit about is that there are very big plans coming for the master plan of our campus. So we hope that, um, and something I think people forget too, is we're only six years old. Um, so we have um, sort of just gotten to a place where now we can build um, a capital campaign that will allow us to expand the campus in the direction that we need to. Um, we already know exactly what that is going to be and what it's going to look like. And I was going to tell you today, and, and he told me not to, because we are going to announce it all at the gala. <laughs> so if you are coming to the gala in two weeks, um, we will be announcing the master plan for the campus, which will, I will tell you, immediately affect the high school and its space. Um, so the high school will be getting brand new incredibly beautiful space that will not require you to drive anywhere. Um, so maybe you can just use your deductive skills to figure out where that could be. But, um, <laughs> but I didn't say it, so then you can't be mad at me. Um, and um, we also were able to um, solidify the future of the space that will become the gym and playing fields. Um, and uh, we have, a, like, we want to create a work, uh, workshop for woodworking and um, robotics and like lots of neat stuff coming down um, as as we grow. Um, I wanted to thank many of you who have been with us from the beginning uh, because um, you've told other people about us. Um, we started with 100 students six years ago and we currently have 410 students. Um, I was looking at some admissions uh, materials yesterday and I happened to look at the pipeline for our admissions. This time last year we had 47 completed applications and as of yesterday, we have 90 people waiting to be admitted to the school for next year, and we don't have that many spots. So, um, actually there's a lot of prospective families here earlier, and a lot of them were expressing a lot of like, if we get in, if we, and I was like, wow, this has never happened to me before. <laughs> it was so fancy, like, um, and so, but that's because of you. That's because of sharing the word of the school. Um, it's allowed us to grow in a really organic and natural way that has meant that lots of like-minded families who are really passionate about what we're doing have come here, and we really value that in this community.